Okay, so. Well, uh, the Lord be with you. So with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have filled the world with beauty. Open our eyes to see your gracious hand in all your works. That rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness. For the sake of the one through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our savior. Amen. Amen. Well, a special welcome back this evening to you, Dr. Ellen Davis. For those of you who were not with us last week, Dr. Davis is the professor of Bible and practical theology at Duke Divinity. She has, this is her second week with us of two. We are so very, very blessed by her teaching. She really is friends, uh, someone who is at the top of her field so equipped to speak with us about the Psalms, to handle the, the translations for us. Even last week as we went along, she was translating on the fly and, and updating things as we went. I can honestly say that in all the time that I have been offering a formation, both at Transfiguration and elsewhere, I've never showed up the day after a class and had the entire staff sit at lunch talking about the subject matter. But we did as a staff sit around and talk about Psalm 65 last week, Dr. Davis, and about all of the explosion of meaning that you brought to us. And so I'm delighted to hand it over to you and to welcome you back for a second week on the Psalms. Well, thank you for telling me that. As you know, that's what makes it worthwhile. So I'm very grateful. I'm going to share my screen. Um, but not lose all your faces, I hope. So, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question I want to raise here this evening is, what is the point of praising God? What is the point of praising God? Um, I think the reason that question comes to my mind is maybe a month or two ago, I got an email from very old friends, people I've known for you know, 40 years and more, um, and who have a church background, at least in youth, I don't think necessarily are active church members now. Um, and the um, and one member of the couple said that the other member of the couple had raised the question, said, what really bothers me about church is all of this emphasis on praise and said, is God so insecure that God needs us to praise God? My immediate answer to that is that if God needed constant affirmation, um, God would have gotten the world down to a very small number of human inhabitants at the very beginning. So, um, so I, you know, I, I think that's probably not the case that God is so insecure that God needs our praise, but it's still a valid question. What is the point of praising God? I'm not going to try to answer that question directly, at least at the outset. Um, but I think the best place to engage it is in the Psalms. You've been studying the Psalms now for six weeks. So I imagine you have the general notion that the shape of the Psalter is um, it's heavy on lament psalms at the beginning and increasingly praise becomes more dominant. You have, it's mixed up all the way through, but there's no question that the, the general tenor of the Psalter is heavy on lament, gradually yielding to a preponderance of praise. So the Psalm that I want, um, 
to, uh, oh, and I should say, and I've put it in my um, handout, so to speak, uh, that the title of the Psalter altogether is Tilim Praisings. Um, so the overall rubric for what these prayers are doing is praising God, uh, even though so many of them are complaining to God. Um, but what I want to do tonight is focus on the psalm that I consider the climax of the Psalter, Psalm 145. It's sort of the great crescendo of um, praise in the Psalter. Well, the last and the last six psalms of the Psalter, beginning with 145, are pure praise. Um, and but this is the longest of them. It's the fullest of them. It is, um, it is an alphabetic psalm. And the way I've set it up, you can see that each verse begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Sion, Chet, Tet, Yod, and so on, all the way to Tav. Um, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet and 21 of them are represented here. Um, so you might say this is, this is praise A to Z. Okay. Um, and I'm, go I'm, just, I'm going to begin by uh, simply reading it to you and then I'll point out a couple of its features. Um, and then we can sort of see what interests you to talk about here. So before you begin, can yeah. I can I interject and ask, is there a way you can um, maximize that screen or expand it? It is showing up fairly small on this end. Mm, yeah, just... hold on just a minute. I think the best way to do that is simply to increase the font size. It's, if I increase the font size now, does that help? It's a little better. I wonder if you can just drag the window, uh, the corner of that, that whole Microsoft Word window across your screen and see if it gets bigger that way. Yes, and then use that magnifier down there at the bottom right where it says 100% and just make it a little bit bigger. That would be wonderful. There we go. There we go. Now I think that's Okay, I'm learning. Okay. That's mm -hmm. the biggest I can get. Well, I still don't have it all on, but I can bring some of it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank we'll, you. We'll do that. Thank you. It's very helpful. Okay. Um and you should have copies. Is that right? This has been sent to everybody? Yes. Okay. This was sent before the first class, and then we sent it again today. So everyone Good. should have a copy of this. Okay. Um, I should say, this is my favorite song. Um, I exalt you, my God, the King. Let me bless your name forever and ever. Every day I bless you. Let me praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and highly praiseworthy. There is no exhausting his greatness. Generation to generation extols your works and your mighty acts, they declare. The glorious splendor of your majesty and your marvelous deeds, I ponder. The power of your awesome acts, they tell, and your greatness, I recount. Remembrance of your abundant goodness, they pour forth, they gush forth, and your righteousness they celebrate. Gracious and compassionate is the Lord, long-suffering and great in covenant love. Good is the Lord to all, and his compassion is upon all his works. All your works acclaim you, O Lord, and your and those covenanted to you, bless you. I was debating a lot about how to translate. This is just one little Hebrew word. 
um, it's two syllables. It's um, chasid in Hebrew, but I couldn't, there's no um, short way to say that in English. So I tried two different things. Uh, all your works claim you, O Lord, and those covenanted to you or your covenant friends bless you. I don't love either one of those, but it's the best I can do right now. The glory of your sovereignty they tell and of your might they speak. To make known to the human family your might and the glorious splendor of your sovereignty. Your sovereignty is sovereignty through all ages and your governance in every single generation. The Lord is supporting all who have fallen and raising up all who have collapsed. The eyes of all look expectantly toward you and you are the one giving them their food in its season, opening your hand and fully satisfying the right desire of all who live. I'll just point out that there are many, many participles in this um, psalm. Participles are not common in Hebrew. Participles, you remember, are ing words. Um, uh, opening your hand, fully satisfying the right desire of all who live. Um, you get the sense that this is what God is doing all the time, every day. This is God's job description. Righteous is the Lord in all his ways and covenant committed or a covenant friend in all his doings. Close is the Lord to all who call upon to, to all who call upon him, to all who call on him in truth. The right desire of those who fear him he enacts, and their cry he hears and he delivers them. The Lord guards all who love him, but all the wicked he annihilates. The praise of the Lord my mouth speaks, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Amen. Okay, I'm going to point out a few things that impress me um, about this. Um, First of all, thinking about what we talked about last week, this ending verse, let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Um, all flesh, almost everywhere in the Bible, refers to human and non-human creatures. Um, so ultimately, uh, and Certainly, um, many Psalms in the Bible show, I think I mentioned this last week, rivers clapping their hands, the hills ringing out for joy when God comes to judge the earth. Um, the Bible does not think that humans are the only creatures capable of offering God praise. And in fact, there's a fairly strong biblical argument that humans are the least able of all the creatures to do what we are created to do, which is to offer praise to God. Um, because the human heart, as Jeremiah says, is um, sick and twisted beyond all things. Um, so that's one thing that impresses me, that it's, it, this is an activity, activity of all created things. Um, and having just used the word all, I will note here that in these 21 verses, the word all occurs 18 times. So um, this is a comprehensive statement about what is happening in the world. Um, God is good, the Lord is good to all and his compassion is upon all his works. Again, human and non-human. All your works acclaim you, O Lord. Um, and those covenanted to you, your covenant friends, bless you. Um, again, I, that isn't necessarily uh, limited to human beings. Um, 
I'm also going to note here that this is a psalm about God's sovereignty. It begins the very first line, I exalt you, my God, the King. Uh, let me bless your name forever and ever. This is about God's sovereignty over all, uh, for all time. So let's look at these verses. Uh, this is what the covenant friends of God are doing. Uh, the glory of your sovereignty they tell and of your might they speak to make known to the human family your might and the glorious splendor of your sovereignty. Your sovereignty is sovereignty through all ages and your governance in every single generation. Um, there's a lot of repetition in here. Hebrew poetry does not have end rhyme. Uh, what ties it together tightly is re repetition of words. That's one thing that ties it together. But also I'm going to point out the Hebrew word for king, um, my God, the king, the Hebrew word for king is melech. Um, that is mem lamed kaf in Hebrew, mlk in English. And the poet is playing with that because right here in the smack in the middle of the psalm, um, we have Mem Lamed Kaf MLK. This is an alphabetic psalm, remember, in reverse order, spelling out Melech. See, so you see, God's kingship, in a sense, is embedded in the very center of this psalm. I might have translated um, this word that I've translated sovereignty. I might well have translated that kingship. Um, so this word is being repeated multiple times here, letting us know in case you didn't get it, that this psalm is about God, the king. Um, I said it's my favorite psalm. And my reason for that is, um, has to do with the history of this psalm's use. Uh, in Jewish tradition, it is said, the Talmud, the um, fourth, fifth and sixth century commentary on scripture and Jewish tradition, the Talmud says that anyone who recites this psalm uh, three times a day has a place in the world to come. Uh, and so the psalm in the daily Jewish liturgy, and there's a daily Jewish liturgy, just like this morning prayer and evening prayer in our traditions, the psalm is recited three times in the daily liturgy. Um, that means one, that um, every Jew who attends liturgy or, um, or says prayers on a daily basis knows the psalm by heart. Um, that also means that Psalm 145 um, has been recited in every situation in which Jews have found themselves. And so I can never read the psalm without thinking about the psalm being recited through pogroms in the Rhine Valley, um, in Auschwitz, in Dachau. Um, and, um, and what it's saying, you might say, in those situations would sound ridiculous. Um, all your works acclaim you the glory of your sovereignty. They tell to make known to the human family your might, your sovereignty, your sovereignty through all generations, your governance in every single generation. Again, think of that being recited um, in the face of the Third Reich. Um, so I see this as a resilient psalm. I'll say one more thing about it, um, and then we can decide how we want to use um, the remaining 
time in this hour. Um, I think this psalm, it be, bespeaks what I'm going to call the logic of overflow. Um, the Irish poet, Patrick Kavanaugh, speaks of his own soul's need to pray unselfconsciously with overflowing speech and arguments that cannot be proven. Uh, Roman Catholic poet, again, I'll read you that line, um, telling of his own soul's need to pray unselfconsciously with overflowing speech and arguments that cannot be proven. I think within the Bible, this is one of the best examples of um, overflowing speech, unconsciously, unselfconsciously prayed, um, and arguments that cannot be proven, arguments about God's sovereignty that often history itself seems to deny. Um, so that is the beginning of a response to my friend's question. Um, what is the point of praising God? Are we doing it because God is so insecure that God needs to hear this from us? Would that be a good place to begin some conversation? I think it would. I think that would be a, a wonderful place to begin conversation for small groups. And I was just in the process of trying to recreate those groups, if you'll give me a moment. Um, so let me, uh, give me just a moment to do that. But I think for, um, I think for folks to consider why it is that we praise God, how this Psalm informs our praise um, would be a worthwhile exercise. How praise informs your own prayer life. I have rooms recreated. Why don't we spend about 20, 25 minutes in small groups visiting about the praise of God and reflecting on that question. And then we'll come back together and have some time to talk. I will open the rooms now. Well, welcome back everyone. I was, I was commenting, I sent out the little, you know, warning notice, we're gonna close the room soon. And then I went and closed the rooms and my comment to the group was, I know when people don't come back immediately that there's rich conversation happening. And so I wonder if, uh, if anyone has some thoughts that they wanna share from their, their group time or questions that came up as you thought about this question, why do we praise God? Why is it that praise is so important in our lives? Okay, we'll go first. Um, so we uh, talked quite a bit about the God needing praise, needs probably the wrong word, but he, re he requires us to praise him because he knows it's good for us. Nice. And it's part of our reminding of our covenant relationship. The, that passage in there that you're having trouble with what is the right translation. Yeah. So it reminds us of our covenant relationship with God and his relationship with us when we praise. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Others? I would like to ask Ms. Davis, um, one, one thing our group noticed, we talked about the structure of, of the sentences, a lot of the verses, and 
I'm wondering how true it is to the Hebrew because a, a lot of the verses start with the direct object. Uh -huh. They start with what is praised and then who does it in the verb. And is, is, that, a, is that in the Hebrew? I tried to make it as transparent to the Hebrew as I could. So if, um, can you point me to one of the verses that you were wondering about? Five, six, and seven, but they're, th they're through, throughout all. Oh, all okay. Through. Yeah, the glorious sp splendor of your majesty. Yes, uh, that's right. The direct object comes first in those sentences, which is unusual word order in Hebrew, just as it's unusual word order in English. Did you have any particular thoughts about? We did. We wondered if that was for emphasis. I think it is. I think absolutely it's for emphasis. But it does. I'm sorry, my, my, my screen froze up. You did say that that, is, that does uh, echo the Hebrew. That's right. That word order. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. Uh, just looking at the, uh, the transcript, of, the script of it, you had the words you and you're underlined a whole lot. Is there a reason for that? I'm so, oh, I think of the you and your. No, the, I didn't personally underline those, and I don't know. I suspect my computer underlines them. Um, the blue mark is their mark saying you've got an editorial, you, you have to look at this as an editorial problem. I think they did not like the fact that I capitalized you and your. Oh, okay. And I did it because. I'm translating the whole Psalter. And in this one, it's not confusing, but in a number of Psalms, it's confusing who is the you. And so I've developed the practice of capitalizing, um, capitalizing all pronouns when they refer to God, just for clarity's sake. Thank you. Another thing to point out is that with respect to the word order, I think it is for emphasis, it certainly serves that purpose, this, this, this foregrounding of the um, direct object, but it also serves the purpose of the alphabet. So as I say, it's an alphabetic psalm. So like A is for apple, Okay, um, hey is for hadar, uh, which means glory and, and splendor and, um, and so on. Uh, Zion is for um, zecher, uh, remembrance and so on. I, I wonder as an exercise uh, to tangent off of this for just a second, we've invited um, everyone to sort of write some of your own Psalms. And I double down on that challenge and say, see if you can pull off a whole Psalm with the alphabet friends <laughs> and uh, see how far you get. I remember being a kid and having, you know, it's having to do an acrostic with your own name, like, you know, all that sort of stuff. See if, uh, I, I, I love this because even, you know, thousands of years ago, um, the faithful were looking for uh, um, sparks to their, um, to their faithful imagination to give new language. They, it wasn't enough just to sort of write another poem or another song to God. They wanted to sort of up the ante and find a new way to, to do it. And, and so, I mean, if, if the exercise of writing your own psalm was, was something that was meaningful to you, then, um, you know, maybe lean into this creative uh, expression that the psalmist had from, from all that time ago and, uh, and try to weave into it additional layers of complexity. Would you like us to do that with the Hebrew alphabet or the English? Uh, I, Either way. Either. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and send them to me. I've, I've only gotten one so far and I love, 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 love it. And uh, for Vicky, so for you, neither has to be in Latin. 
That's right. <laughs> well, well, that, 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 that would be too easy for Vicki. I think I she know. should do both Hebrew and English. I know, I know. <laughs> but if I could say something about the alphabet, the um, there are several alphabetic psalms in the Psalter, mm -hmm. and the alphabetic acrostic is, and of course the the outstanding alphabetic psalm in the Psalter is Psalm 119, which has eight lines for every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, but the alphabetic acrostic, acrostic is the Hebrew equivalent of the sonnet. Uh, they, as I mentioned to you, there's no end rhyme in biblical Hebrew poetry. Um, but, but the alphabet fascinates um, Israelite poets, and the alphabet is a, is a, a West Semitic um, invention. It was invented along the Levantine coast from what we would now call Syria down to Sinai in the second millennium before the common era. There were all kinds of alphabetic experiments going on. Basically the alphabet is a one-time, um, it's a one-time invention. And so it's, in, it's invented on the Levant and then it moves through Phoenician traders. It moves west to Greece and to Rome. Um, and, you know, all over the Mediterranean world. So I think, you know, they knew they were onto something incredibly smart um, because anybody can learn the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet in a couple of days and become, not, you know, just slightly at least functional. Uh, whereas in, if you're working with hieroglyph hieroglyphics or cuneiform, only very, very few people can gain any grasp of that at all. So it's a highly elitist way of writing. And that really gets turned on its head with the invention of the alphabet. And of course, it wasn't scribes who invented the alphabet. It was slaves in the copper mines um, in Egypt, for instance, who were doing alphabetic experiments. It's a way of, of Claim, the people claiming power. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's part of what's going on here. They're, they're proud of themselves. What I heard in that y'all was an offer that you could write a psalm in the form of a sonnet. And I am <laughs> waiting for that to come into my email as well. <laughs> so get to work and <laughs> I just can't wait to see what y'all come up with. <laughs> Not being a poet. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a wonderful understanding about these alphabetic. I might be able to write a pen tomb. Do you know what that is? I don't. I don't think so. Later. This, this is for a later discussion. <laughs> it's, it's a French form of poetry. Uh-huh. Any of these forms Look of it up. Are, are helpful when we're setting about to write something. By the way, form can help. Um, Malcolm Geit, uh, a priest in the Church of England, Geit, G-U-I-T-E, has within the last year, because uh, he did it during COVID, um, published a book, Canterbury Press, uh, called David's Crown, and it's 150 psalms, each of them a kind of response to the 150, it's 150 poems in response to the 150 psalms, um, and it is in the English form of the corona, and so the last verse of Psalm one, uh, the last verse of the first poem becomes the first verse or the first line of the second poem. Um, and 
on and on and on through the 150. Um, it's, a, it's quite remarkable. Um, and, and in each one, he's picking out something, uh, maybe one line, one image that speaks to him and developing that. And, and his poems are distinctly Christian. Um, He's a um, wonderful poet and Mother Rebecca and I both had a chance, uh, the Diocese of Dallas welcomed him as the speaker at a clergy retreat a couple of years ago. Okay. And uh, he came and um, talked poetry to a room full of uh, to a room full of clergy and blessed us. And then, and that Rebecca and I have ever since um, really cherished his poetry. Yeah. And, um, and it's found its way into a sermon or two for you, Rebecca, I think. So I can't wait to find, um, to find this new volume. That's awesome. Uh, what is his name again? I put it in the yeah. comments. Maybe. Okay. It's in okay. the chat. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's Malcolm Geit. Any final thoughts tonight, y'all, on uh, on what we've explored tonight about praise? So we talked about uh, how praise, praising God, and also lamentation helps us drop our boundaries. So there's a real intimacy to that, and we saw that in this psalm, uh, where there's the translation, Dr. Davis, with the word friend, and that kind of really uh signified the intimacy of of praising god mm -hmm. and then people brought up examples when they praised god in times of difficulty um and, and so that was one of the aspects we discussed today thank you for mentioning that it, it um as i told you that's one of it's one of the hardest words for me to figure out what to do with. Um, and so as I'm, as I'm thinking about this translation of the whole Psalter, um, it's very helpful to hear how an attempt at a rendering is heard by somebody. So thanks for that. Any final thoughts? Uh, Y'all, thank you so much for joining us for these several weeks, um, exploring with us. We're gonna conclude this evening with um, Compline as we, as we do, as is our custom. Um, uh, it has um, been such a joy, Dr. Davis, to have you as we did last week. If you would be willing to be the people in our praying of Compline to make it simpler for the Zoom microphones and speak people speaking all at the same time, I will share my screen. So you'd like me to be the people? Will you be the people? I'll be the people, okay. Yeah. And uh, in honor of uh, Sherilyn and Scott, uh, I have to use the forward movement page to uh, to pray Compline this evening. That seemed fitting. Um, so I want credit for that. Cheryl, and you pass that word on, please. <laughs> the Lord grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have, we have sinned, against sinned against you through our own, our own fault in thought and word and deed and what we have left, we left undone. For the sake of your Son, your Son our Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, forgive us forgive all, us all our offenses and grant that we and may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the, and Father, to the Father, and to the and Son, to the Son and to and the Holy, to the Holy Spirit. Spirit.
as it was, as it was in the beginning, beginning is now, now and will, and be, will forever. be forever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you'll alternate verses with me, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my stronghold. My God, in whom I put my trust. He shall deliver you from the snare of the hunter and from the deadly pestilence. He shall cover you with his pinions and you shall find refuge under his wings. His faithfulness shall be a shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of any terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, of the plague that stalks in the darkness, nor of the sickness that lays waste at midday. A thousand shall fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you your eyes have only to behold, to see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the most high your habitation, there shall no evil happen to you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. You shall trample the young lion and the serpent under your feet. Because he is bound to me in love. Therefore will I deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I am with him in trouble. I will rescue him and bring him to honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Hold now, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You that stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you out of Zion. Glory to the Father, Father and, and to the Son. Son and to the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit as, it was, as it was in the beginning, is now, is now and, will be, and forever. will be forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, you are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us, O Lord our God. Thanks be to God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be, hallowed your, be your name. Your kingdom, your kingdom come. come. Your will, your be, will done. be done. On earth, on as, earth, earth as in heaven. Us Give us today, today our daily bread. Forgive us Forgive our, sins, our sins as we forgive, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time, from the time of trial and deliver, and deliver us, us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Look down, O Lord, from your heavenly throne and illumine this night with your celestial brightness, that by night as by day, your people may glorify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night. And give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. Shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. Friends, I invite your prayers at this time, either unmuting so that we can pray with you or in the quiet of your own heart. We thank you, Lord, for your servant, Ellen, for all of her work and the way that she blesses the church. And we ask that you would continue to bless her in her work still to come. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for Israel and Palestine. Nancy. For grace, Lord, that we would have praise on our lips and amidst all our circumstances. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping. Guide us sleeping. That awake, awake we may watch Christ. with Christ. And asleep, asleep we, may we may rest in peace. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see. A light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. Guide us waking, guide us waking O Lord, and guard us, guide us sleeping, that, that awake, awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep, asleep we may rest, rest in peace. Hallelujah. 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 Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a pleasure, friends. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Dr. Davis, what a wonderful gift you've given us. We hope we might be able to welcome you back someday in the future. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Good night. Thank you. Good night, all. Peace Thank you.